Well, folks, we're going to go some places you ain't never been before. We're going some places I ain't never been before. We know that there are pagan gods and false gods. We know that there are principalities and powers. We know that there are rulers and spiritual places and darkness. When I ask the question, where did they come from? Did God create the prince of Persia that held back the prayers from Daniel? Did God create? It's a mystery. But we're going to look at Thou shalt have no other gods before me. This is an admission from Yahweh God that there are other gods. When were they created? Were they created? How did they happen? Where did Baal come from? Where did Moloch come from? Where did Venus and Ashtarte come from? They were given powers over the earth. They were given rulership. But when and where did this all begin? Look at Exodus 20, 1 through 3 with me. I've told you that there's a new book out that has swept over my mind. I'm on my third reading of it. Haven't taken notes, tearing it apart. And I believe it is telling us why the world is in the condition it is in. But I believe that there needs to be some answers, some questions answered before we jump into that. If there are gods who are controlling our world right now and leading us towards destruction, we need to understand them just a little bit more. So Exodus 20, 1 through 3 says, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Amen? Amen. Other gods are spoken of by our God. And the question we want to address today is, who are they and when are they? And how are they? Amen? I'll be honest with you and tell you that the Bible does not specifically say this. The Bible, does, I can't turn to four verses and say, that's it, we're done. Congratulations, we got the answer. The Bible does not say. But it still might tell us. You know what I mean? May not come out and say, but we may be able to pick up the scraps along the way and we may be able to make something of that. And that's what we're going to do. But I'm going to start the sermon by saying the Bible does not specifically say where they came from. Genesis 1 through 11 is ancient world history. You understand that this is the history of the ancient world before the flood. We have Adam and Eve, we've got Cain and Abel, we've got Noah and the flood, we have the Tower of Babel. And all that we know about the ancient world is in the scriptures. Everything that we know about the pre-flood and the pre-Babel experience, because in 12 we suddenly come up with this guy named Abraham. And the whole world changes. But in the first 11, wow, there's a lot going on. There's a lot happening. In Genesis 1.1, turn with me to Genesis 1.1, we might get our first glimpse of who, why, when, and how. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the yes. plural and earth singular. Now, whether or not there are other beings living out there in the universe and they're trying to communicate through UFOs, I just say, <laughs> God created the earth. The earth. Yes, period. The earth. I don't have to question that, okay? I love watching those shows about UFOs. I do. Carol laughs at me because I'll have those UFO ancient aliens on. But, but I'm watching them because I think they're so humorous. I think they're so funny. They don't intend to be comedies, but they are because they're trying to explain what the Bible says clearly and not use the Bible. Yeah. And sometimes they just sound ridiculous. Yeah. 
How many of you know you get twisted up like a pretzel when you try and explain the world away without using the Bible? Being in academics, I've run into this all the time, the intellectuals that we have to read and listen to and, and sit around and talk with over coffee, and they think they are so smart. They are so dumb. They can, t they can write three books and take 15 lectures of what three words of Scripture covers. If they just believed it, they'd be done. Yes. But the word heavens here is an interesting word because it means the abode of the stars, the sky, and the atmosphere. It's what's above us, the heavens. Okay? But it also means the abode of God, the heavenly realm. The heavenly realm. So it means two things. Here we have a place that is very physical and we have a place that is very spiritual. A spiritual place. In the very beginning, he created the heavens. Now, because it has two definitions doesn't mean that there are only two heavens. We know that there are layers of heaven. Paul says, I went up into the third heaven, right? Yeah. So there are layers of, of, of this, and we're not going to teach about that. We'll teach, we can teach about that later. But, but the Bible is very clear that there are levels and layers and different types of heavens. But what it is, is in the very beginning, God built a spiritual place and he built a physical place. In the beginning, there was physical and there was spiritual. Now, a spiritual place isn't very spiritual if there ain't nothing spiritual there. If I build a spiritual room and have no spiritual beings in there, how spiritual is that room? It takes beings. It takes spiritual beings to inhabit the place for it to become a spiritual place. Does that make sense? Yes. I can't have a physical place if I don't create a physical person to dwell in that place. I can say, well, it's a physical place. Anybody there? No. Nope. It's not very physical. So the physical and the spiritual are both alluded to. Go to Job with me. Those of you that don't know, Job is probably the oldest book. It probably predates Moses. Predates him. Job 38 predates the Pentateuch. Job 38, 4 through 7, is written as a Middle Eastern poem or drama. Now that does not mean that it did not happen. We have poems and dramas about live events and live people all throughout history. People write epics and they write poetries and they write dramas about this. It's written very much as a drama as a play, a stage play, that would tell Job's life. The movie we're going to see Friday night was, according to the screen we just looked at, based on a true story, you see? A drama based upon truth. This is not to diminish the fact that Job existed. But it's written in a dramatic form. So Job 38, 4 says, Where were you, this is God, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have an understanding. Who set its measurements? Since you know, or who stretched the line in it? Or what were its bases sunk? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the... Sons of God shouted for joy. So we have both a physical place and we have a spiritual place, don't we? It is alluded to here and told to us that we have both. So sons of God, we have to ask the question, who? Who are the sons of God? We'll go to Job 1, verse 6. Job 1 begins with a conclave, with a conference, with a meeting. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? In other words, you're late, where have you been? Satan answered, Lord said, I'm roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. Now, God doesn't say, well you ignoramus, you're late, what you been doing? Because, you see, we know that the very foundation of the place that we are has been given to Satan. He's walking in his property. He's there. 
And in this conclave, there is more than God and there is more than Satan sitting around. There are the sons of God, those created spiritual beings that most of us would call angels. Okay? Look at Genesis 6, 2. Here we read the very exact same term, Genesis 6, 2, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose. Now some people are a little freaked out and ickied out about the fact that angels may have come down and actually had relationships with human people. But the Old Testament is full of angels taking human form, is it not? Story after story with Abraham and the prophets and different leaders of Israel were met by the sons of God who took on human form. They have that ability. They, I, listen, I hate to scare you with this, but y'all are the same. Y'all are spirits who have taken on a human form. Come on, here you go. Aren't we all spirits? Amen. Well, we've taken on this human form. Now, the LDS church, the Mormon church, taking that a step farther and said, well, we're all spirit babies when we get born here. We pass through the veil of forgetfulness and we're born into the flesh. And then when we die, we go back through the veil of remembrance and we remember who and what we were all that time. Huh. May I just say hogwash? <laughs> That ain't anywhere in Scripture. That ain't anywhere in Scripture. But I am a spiritual being, and I am eternal. And I've taken on flesh. This is not a first-time event. This is a normal event. We just don't talk about it much. We don't think about it much. We don't philosophize about it much. They, they turn a corner and go into error. Let's keep it where it needs to be. And that is that here, there seemed to have been a time when angels came in a human form and had relations with human people. And it created a strange race on the earth. The giants, the Nephilim, of which Goliath and his family were one of the last of the race. All right? All right. I know that's a lot to put in your spoon, but it's still cereal. Let's hang on, okay? Genesis 6-2 talks about the sons of God in the same respect and says that these spiritual beings were able to interact. You see, we have sons of God who came by birth, and that's Jesus, but these aren't them. We have sons of God that came by adoption. That's you and me. But we also have sons of God that are referred to who are by creation. Sons of God by creation, sons of God by adoption, sons of God by birth. Everybody with me? Yep. So we have sons of God. Well, we know it wasn't Jesus, so we know it wasn't believers who came down and had relationships. So we we're talking about angels, those that were by creation, sons of God by creation. When did all this happen? Was this before the creation of the world? Was this after the Garden of Eden? Was this before the flood, after the flood? When did all of this take place? Genesis 2. Told you we're going some places. Genesis 2, 1 and 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their... What? All their hosts. So earth has hosts. Adam and Eve. And the heavens have hosts. The heavenly host, we call them in Scripture. By the seventh day, God completed His work, which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work, which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it He rested from all His work, which God had created and made. So angels were created as heavenly hosts in the first six days. Were they created before the first six days? Scripture doesn't say. Doesn't say. We can just say that by day seven, we got angels. Whether they became, they came before the earth, I don't know. But it says he created the heavens and the earth in one, and that's a spiritual place, and it seems like he inhabits the spiritual and the physical place. That's all I can tell you about that. Okay? Exodus 20, verse 11. 
Just before the Ten Commandments, just before the Ten Commandments, we read this verse. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, plural, and the earth, singular, the sea and all that is in them, rest, multiple seas, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Wow. Wow. Why would he stop and bring that up right in the middle of it except he's told them that they're supposed to make the day holy too? Why? I'm done. It is finished. Amen. It is finished. The Lord looked down and saw that it was good and it was good. Did you know that happened on the cross too? It's finished. It's good. But look at Colossians 1. It gives us some real insight. Oh, Paul got some insight here. Colossians 1, 16. For by him, Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens, plural, and on earth, singular, visible and... Ah, oh, there's them spirit beings again, see? Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. This was all done in the first six days, folks. It was all done then. The thrones, the dominions, the rulers, the authorities in the spirit realm have already been set in place when Adam and Eve are being tempted in the garden. You see, the evil one has already become evil. So the Bible doesn't tell us but it tells us. Mm -hmm. yes. Make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So the who and the when. Well, we start with God. He creates angels. And we know that Satan comes along. Yes. Then he creates man. And because of Satan's influence, we have fallen man. Somewhere in this mix, then, we have fallen angels. I can't tell you if it was before or after the fall of man. I personally think that since it says all dominions, all thrones, and all rulers, that it was before the creation of man. I think Satan already had his army ready to go. Can't prove it. Cannot prove it. But my gut tells me that. Your gut tell you something different? I love you. It's okay. I could be as wrong as the day is long. But it's where I'm going. Then this ancient world history ends with the story of the Tower of Babel, which again I think is key to understanding this whole question. Genesis 11, 1 through 9. We've gone through the flood and the world is again populated. Now, the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name, otherwise we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Let's create a government. Let's create a structure. Let's create a city and a nation. Let's not be scattered as tribes. Let's, let's band together and make this work. Well, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. 
The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have, one, have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Think about that. Think about that. Just the power that God has put inside of man. We can really screw this place up because we got the power. Amazing. You know, we've said before that the one thing that God can't do is break your will. Does that make sense? If you choose not to believe in Jesus, you will die without believing Jesus. Why? Because you choose to. And what is that? He can't break your will. He chooses not to. Could he break your will? Of course he could. Of course he could. He'd flip a switch inside you, make you cry like a baby, and crawl on glass to get to him if he wanted to. Yep. But he gave you free will. Amen, brother. How many times do we fall into sin because we choose to? How many times do we fall into depression and despair because we choose to? How many times do we look to the world for comfort and for, for peace because we choose to? Yeah, yeah. God says here that if they, if they really use everything I put in them, nothing's impossible for them. Explains a lot of the lost world, doesn't it? Yeah. Seven says, come, let us go down and there confuse their language. The us there is always problematic for, for atheists and agnostics unless you remember that there is a trinity and that there is a heavenly host. And they are one team. They're one side of the game. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. So rather than them banding together and becoming as God, God scattered them and we have the nations that we have today. And we all, the sound babble is just really appropriate. The only word that is more appropriate than babble is the word murmur. The children of Israel got into so much trouble because they murmured. And everybody just say murmur over and over again with me. Murmur, 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 murmur. That's what it sounds like. That's what murmuring sounds like. We just sit back and talk about one another. Murmur, murmur, murmur. Isn't it too bad they aren't like me? Murmur, murmur, murmur. Babbling. Because the Lord confused the language. This scripture tells us that there are many languages that are going to become many nations. Does it not? I will confuse the language of the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Many languages will become many nations. Heard Isaiah 14. Right now you're thinking, where are we going? No, so, just enjoying the ride. Good, good. <laughs> Isaiah 14, verse 4. The prophet Isaiah, in verse 14, Start with three, says, And it will be in the day when the Lord gives you rest from your pain and turmoil and harsh service in which you have been enslaved, that you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon and say, How the oppressor has ceased and how fury has ceased. Babylon and Babel are signs of enslavement and oppression. Think about our America right now in enslavement and oppression to a spiritual being, Babylon and Babel. Look at 13 and 14 verses, same, same chapter. Go down to 13, 14. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Now this verse is often attributed to Satan. I believe it can be attributed to Satan. I believe that it's very appropriate. But it also is pointedly at the king of Babylon, which is this world. And I want to assure you what God does to the king of Babylon then, now, and in the future. 
13 says, But you said in your heart, I will send to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Isn't that what the Tower of Babel was about? You see? Refers to Babel. Refers to Babylon. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit in the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will make myself like the Most High. Babel. Babylon. Did you know that there are more black holes in what is just above the North Star than any other place in the galaxy? There are more black holes above the North Star area of the cosmos. Isn't that amazing that 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, they talk about the recesses of the North. This is a very scientific book. It has astronomy in it. I'll raise my throne above the stars of God. This is about Babel. This is about Babylon. This is about raising a tower up. And God smacks them and their tower down. Amen? Amen. Well, it tells us many languages become many nations. We see in the rest of the New Testament or the Old Testament that those many nations each come up with their own gods. So the Tower of Babel and the breaking down of the people into dispersion not only gives us many nations, but now many nations give us many gods. Look at Deuteronomy 4, verses 19 and 20. Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20. Bobby, what would you do in church yesterday? We learned where pagan gods came from. <laughs> Deuteronomy 4, 19. And beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the hosts of heaven and be drawn away and worship them and those which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the but the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the fiery furnace from Egypt to be a people for his own possession as today. The multitudes of gods of Egypt had to come from somewhere, and it came from the creation of many nations as the nations proclaimed their own God as they turned their back on the Creator One Yahweh God. They knew the story of Yahweh. They knew the story of Creator God. Because remember, there were still people running around at the flood who had known and met an elderly Adam. How many of them knew the story? You see? Well, God is reminding these people who have been enslaved for 400 years and have maybe lost some of the stories and forgotten some of the truth so that God later had to tell Moses and Moses wrote it down and he called it Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The first five books. The Pentateuch. So that it could be written and not forgotten. And no one would make a mistake of memory because God told what to write. So here we have gods that are being served and worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples. He's allowed, is what it means, has allowed all the peoples. Look at Deuteronomy 32, verses 7, 8, and 9. Deuteronomy 32, 7, 8, and 9. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of all generations. Ask your father, and he'll inform you. Your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, when was that? Babel. Babel. He set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. We have the beginning of the nation of Israel. Of all the nations and their gods, this one, I am their God. And they are my people. 
So we have many languages create many nations. Many nations create many gods. Look at 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 5, 1 through 5. The Ark of the Covenant has been taken. It's been stolen by the Philistines. And in, verse, in chapter 5, verse 1, we read, Now the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. That's a Philistine god. When the Ashdodites arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord. Their big story and a half tall statue had fallen on its face. Now, just think about a statue with a big base around it. And it takes a whole bunch of people to tip it over because of the size of the base. You get it, and it rocks and comes back. And your rock comes back. Not this time. <laughs> Down. Well, the Ashdodites rose early the next morning. Behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him up in his place again. When they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. This time the head of Dagon and both the palms of hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor all who enter Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this very day. Now the hand of the Lord was heavy on the Ashdodites, and he ravaged them and he smote them with hemorrhoids, both Hashdod and its territories. That is not a good plague to get. Nope. Not a good plague. But God struck them. You see, there were false gods already. But our God proved who was in charge. So, many nations, many gods. Here's one of them. Look at Daniel 10, 12 and 13. Daniel 10, 12 and 13. We see in Daniel 10, 5, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Ephaz. His body was like beryl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet were like the gleam of polished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a tumult. If you look at Revelation, you know who this is. <coughs> Jesus is on the scene. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, the great dread fell on them and they ran away to hide themselves. The presence of God made the others flee. Verse 8 says, So I was left alone and saw this great vision. Yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. This is scriptural representation of what is today called being slain in the spirit. Now I believe that uh, we've already talked about that in Pentecostal churches it becomes a carnival trick and becomes overused. It becomes uh, silly when a guy can do this and a whole stadium falls down. Um, that's not scriptural. But being so overwhelmed by the presence of God that you can no longer stand before Him is some place that not enough Christians have ever been and don't even know that it exists. Yes. In His presence. That's where I belong. Yeah. Well, anyway, jumping down to our verses 12 and 13, that's the background. Then this man said to me, Jesus said, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard. They were heard in heaven. And I've come in response to those words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. In other words, there was a spiritual power that had so much sway over the Persian empire 
that he had a dome over it, a spiritual dome, and the answers couldn't get through. And you go, really? Yeah, it goes on and says, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Jesus was contending with those spiritual beings. And Michael came and did an end around. Kept the princes busy, and Jesus said, you handle them. Now, does it mean that Jesus could not get past the princes of Persia? No, it probably meant that the princes of Persia were going to damage or harm the people if Jesus got through. You know, like, a, like when a criminal holds a knife up to someone's neck and says, if you come any closer, I'll kill him, I'll kill him. Jesus, you come any closer and I'll take these people out because you've given me authority over them. You've given me a rule over them. I'll swipe out every firstborn child. I'll swipe out all the women in the nation so that they'll be barren. I will do this. Michael comes and contends and Jesus says, excuse me, I've got bigger things to do. But what does that say? It says that pagan gods have power. They can sway nations and they can sway individuals. They can tempt us. They can lead us astray. They can put things in front of us that we choose to follow, like breadcrumbs. I think of the movie E.T. and Reese's Pieces being laid out. And E.T. followed them. Oh, how we are like that sometimes. How we can be led astray. He goes and says in verse 12, Your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. 13, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was standing for me for 21 days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. There are spiritual beings that can so contend with our will that we can turn our will towards the lost and to the uh, demonic and God can't break that will. Isn't that what we said in the beginning? God cannot break my will. And I can be so sweet-talked and so tempted. And the thing sounds so good that I go, Oh, hath God said, really? Did he really say that? Then what the devil asked Adam and Eve? Then what he asked Jesus? Isn't that what he asks you? Of course he does. Of course he does. Look at Exodus 12.12. 12. Exodus 12.12 12 says, For I will go through the land of Egypt on that first night, and I will strike down all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. You see, this is where I'm getting the Daniel story from, that it can go both ways. It can go both ways. Both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am I am yes. the Lord I am but it says he's going to both man and beast and against all the gods of Egypt many nations many gods all right we're going to have to stop there <laughs>